bringing you Block Digest episode 273 at block height 691,168 on Thursday, July 15th. And yes, it has been a while. Yes, it's the midpoint of the year. It's <laughs> past the midpoint. Wow. 2020. Isn't it so easy to keep schedules, guys, when everybody's like situation is shifting around and, and different things going on? Yeah. Uh-huh. That seems to be uh, something we're striving to work with. So forgive us if it's been a little bit, but that is the case. We've, we've been shifting and, well, here we are now. We've all been having wild summers. Oof. I assaulted Lake Michigan with an AK-47 firework on the 4th of July. Nice. 4th of July over here was airplane flyovers, parades, and children at play. It was pretty uh, American. Did you say you assaulted Lake Michigan? Yes, I assaulted Lake Michigan with an AK-47. I am very offended by this. Why would you assault a lake? Because I was high on mushrooms. Oh, wow. That sounds like fun. Mushrooms and shooting AK-47s at a lake. Wow. Well, happy 4th of July. I guess it was. If you had assaulted Lake Superior, I might be impressed. Yeah, well, that's that's too far away. Michigan deserved it, I guess. Yep. So, we ready to get into stuff, guys? Yeah, I mean, there has been a lot happening, and more in the way of jurisdictions making their way into Bitcoin, so bring us into it. Yep. Uh, I do want to caveat this, though, with I have not comprehensively read this bill um, due to schedule crunches this week, Um, so I'm going to be relaying information um, from somebody down in Panama, I know, who also did not thoroughly read this bill um but actually was able to disclosure read the original, was able to read the original spanish version um but effectively there's two major things i think about this that are very different um from what happened in el salvador um one this is a very general Um, crypto related bill um, encompassing things beyond just Bitcoin. So this is not like El Salvador where they specifically delineated Bitcoin only applied the legislation to Bitcoin only. Um, This is going to be um, completely general for all cryptocurrencies. And second, um, there is a major mining component explicitly in the bill um like th- they're pretty much structuring things to specifically carve out um look at mining the mining industry and specifically clarify things around that and um some very interesting things i think this is going to lead to if this winds up passing um let me find the name of it real quick um but yeah there there's this um dam in Argentina, I think. Yeah. Um, no. Um, I think in southern Brazil. Okay. Um, so this is the biggest hydro dam in the world, aside from the Three Gorges Dam in China. And if if you've listened to this show autistically uh, for years, you might remember that Bitfury a few years back actually started setting up some mining operations on this dam site. Um, 
And apparently, um, the, the construction of this was kind of like a political partnership between Brazil and uh, Paraguay. And soon, I think, in the next few months, um, I think, um, is what uh, the, the person I talked to said. Uh, a lot of that electricity capacity is going to revert from Brazil's control to Paraguay's control. Um, so the, like the second biggest hydro dam in the world. Um, so yeah, I think Paraguay, if, if this passes, and I do want to remind people like um, th this is only being pushed by two politicians. So this is not the same kind of situation in El Salvador where you have the president with a massive amount of support in Congress pushing something. So whether this passes or not, we'll see. Um, but if it does, uh, yeah, I think Paraguay is really setting themselves up to just start directly mining and accumulating Bitcoin. Um, and if that winds up being their strategy, um, once the electricity capacity from this dam reverts to Paraguay, um, they could wind up with a pretty big stack of Bitcoin um, for a country in their situation. So this is going to be kind of interesting to watch. Right on. Another major country with another major source of energy. And I mean, you know, everybody's trying to pack up and leave those Three Gorges Dam in China. So this is uh, right in line with where mining needs to go. I mean, some of it, <laughs> I imagine it's going to be split up and go into different areas. But yeah, I mean, another big hydroelectric dam after one's getting shut down, that just sounds a little too, that's uh, that's how the story rolls. Yep. So they're also trying to do legal tender bill similarly, but they're not specifically mentioned Bitcoin. It's mainly cryptocurrencies. Well, see, that's the thing. Um, from my understanding of this, they're not really going like the full kind of mandated um, acceptance and things like that. This looks to me more just like loosening tax regimes and kind of just accepting the, the, these assets as money. But like re the, the core, though, I think of the bill is the mining carve out. And that, like, I think, like, this really does look like this is a nation state that wants to become a miner, not just open up mining, like, like they want to mine, um, it is kind of my perception of this. Well, that's good, and certainly does clear the way to make it legal tender, and maybe it's better that they're not dictating what's legal tender, and they're just allowing the market to pick it. Yep, I mean, we'll see how it plays out. And I guess real quick, just because at this point, with how long it took us to sit down and record, this is old news. But um, yeah, thirty thirty dollars of free Bitcoin to anybody who downloads the uh, Chivo wallet, um, being set up by the government in El Salvador. Um, I'm actually kind of interested to see how that plays out. Uh, how many people actually spend that and use that versus just save and hold it. Um, you know, I see, I see a big potential for people with a hustler mentality down there to really try to accumulate Bitcoin just through work or selling things. Um, when that wallet actually rolls out and starts being widely adopted, um, like that, that's a very interesting dynamic and opportunity, I think for some people who, recognize that and seize on it yeah it'll be interesting to see what percentage of the uh local populace there actually gets into it that way i mean thirty dollars for the average el salvadorian i'd imagine would be you know not substantial but enough to you know make you maybe use that wallet over another for at least a period of spending thirty dollars worth of bitcoin yeah, exactly. At the very least, it buys you lunch a couple of days. Right. Mm -hmm. But for the guy who figures out, um, you know, what to do to acquire that Bitcoin, there's a lot of people with $30 of Bitcoin out there. And if he 
can sell something, find something that everybody wants, you can, you can wind up with a lot more than $30 in Bitcoin. Yeah, for some people, it'll be just the right entry and it'll be life changing. And hey, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. People are entering their way into a financial, you know, a financial instrument that they've never had access to before and the network tied to that instrument. Just want to mention real quick for the uh, <laughs> Paraguay story, uh, that thing about uh, Bitfury um, going into Paraguay for mining uh, was a story uh, that was talked about in episode 155 back in February 2019. Check it out. I think that might have been, were we talking about, um, well. 20, 2019? What's, what's that? No, nothing existed before COVID. What what are what are those numbers? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure Bitcoin was uh, much higher than it was today, right? <laughs> yeah, it only goes I, down. I, like I don't. I don't think Bitcoin existed below 10k. That's right. We all just got spit into this universe. Before COVID, before 10k. But the, before four times. But yeah, if, any, <laughs> if anyone wants to hear uh, that story, episode 155, the headline was Bitfury Partners with South Korean Company to Build Paraguay Mines, episode 155. Nice. I should go back and listen to it. I was going back and listening to some of our super old episodes, just reminiscing, going, gosh, we've been doing this for years. Ah, what a bunch of suckers we are. Well. So fun. And why dig? What the fuck is going on? Like, like, come on, S spill the crazy. Yep, this is uh, BTC FUD here for your big banking connector updates. Um, I dig dropped uh, two headlines since we've been around. They probably dropped more and I just haven't caught them. Uh, but it seems they continue to uh, connect with financial intermediaries all over the place. Uh, so the first one is uh, called Fiserv. Uh, they do, according to them, they are a leading global, global provider of payments and financial service technology solutions. Uh, so they move money and they connect banks. Uh, got about 40,000 employees and NIDIG is going to have an integration, I believe, to their banking backends, uh, allowing other banks to use NIDIG for custody for Bitcoin for their clients on top of Pfizer services. And similarly, uh, a very large company called NCR, they've got about 34,000 employees, National Cash Register, uh, all sorts of retail penetration is also doing a NIDIG partnership. Uh, according to Forbes, phase one of the NIDIG partnership will allow NCR's banking clients to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies from their mobile application. Uh, so the purchaser will feel like they're banking uh, with the traditional bank that NCR does white box products for, uh, but actual assets will be custodied by NIDIG. Uh, there are some details in this one. It says when a customer wants to buy Bitcoin, it's sourced from various regulated OTC desks and exchanges and sold at a slight markup based on the size of the trade and other factors. Uh, NIDIG is receiving a per user per month fee uh, from any bank using the services, uh, which uh, was interesting. I hadn't heard anybody else say that yet. but. Uh, so NIDIG is essentially doing bolt-on per user services for the banks. So in other words, the U.S. financial system is starting to plug into Lightning and Bitcoin. This is going to get really interesting, man. Um, I really think in the next few years, we're going to be looking at things like SWIFT, like correspondent banking networks. And just see them shrinking and shrinking and shrinking because you just have an instant thing like lightning and bitcoin that you can use to do the same type of settlement with all the counterparty risk just goodbye goodbye 
Yeah, anything with counterparty risk, fees, or regulatory oversight overhead uh, going to be put under pressure by this sort of thing. And I don't have the list right in front of me, but uh, these these guys at NIDIG have now integrated with FIS, Pfizer, and NCR, which I don't know what percentage of U.S. banks that covers, but it's a lot of decent-sized banks and credit unions. So NIDIG is out there pushing probably Coinbase Custodial uh, and whoever the other prudential largest kind of players in this space are probably Fidelity, not Prudential. Um, like they're, they're taking ground here and we might not see this in bank offerings yet, but just the idea that they can flip a switch and provide a service like this means that inevitably, inevitably some will. You think competition in banking? Can't wait. Grandma is going to buy so many Bitcoins. I mean, it's like, dude, that is a, a, a fucking interesting thing on its own. But I like, I'm just purely focused and interested in the replacing settlement systems. Like, there are so many, like, networks that literally exist <clears throat> just to move money from one institution to another that have all kinds of inefficiencies, costs like political capital that they can squeeze and pressure people with. And now that that one door that existed in the form of those networks and institutions um, in the wall, it's got the one that says Lightning Network right next to it, and there's no lock on it. So the, the jackass playing gatekeeper with the old door, like he, he's just going to scare people or push people into walking through the door with no lock. And to be fair, Pfizer and NCR, they are those old gatekeepers. They clear millions and millions, maybe billions of payments per day. They make billions of dollars a year and they provide those rails. So these are the guys figuring out slowly but surely uh, the age of film is over and the age of digital photography is now at hand. Yep. Well. It's incredible the days we're in where institutions are not only taking Bitcoin seriously, but they're actively trying to steer their self into uh, ahead of the curve with its development. I'll throw one more in there that I, I saw today out on Twitter that's just kind of a read and then we can be done with talking about banks. But Wells Fargo supposedly sent out a uh, memorandum, you know, a multi-page write-up on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to their uh, private banking clients today after they closed down um, credit lines uh, as a product across all of their, their banks. So personal credit lines are done at Wells Fargo, but soon to offer cryptocurrency products. Wrecked. Wow. Well, all right. So are we ready for some other cool lightning stuff that doesn't have to do with banks? Yay. Please. So Blue Wallet um, is teasing a re-implementation of lightning using the lightning dev kit um, that uh, Square Crypto has been building out. And this is fucking fun. So the demonstration that they drop with this shows somebody funding a lightning channel in one hop directly out of their cold storage wallet um, using PSBTs. Um, but aside from that, um, they now support encrypted channel backups in the cloud um, so that the seed is all you need to restore a wallet, um, the ability to use a wallet on several different devices, um, a new sync mode through Electrum servers um, that goes like that. You can even hook it up to your own Electrum server. Um, the potential for um, having a routing graph um, or a route um, for your payment just pulled from an API instead of syncing the routing graph locally. Um, and um, yeah, the fun part about this is just the modularity which is the whole reason the LDK was built out in the first place. 
every other lightning implementation, everything is hard coded in terms of behavior, what you can do, what you can't do, the flexibility for this. LDK is instead of just a, a software client, it's just the library that does all the little things a software client is set up to do so that people actually building the software client can play around, make things as flexible, as modular as they want, offer this feature, but not that one, and, and not have to deal with a, a nightmare of what is the actual lightning node we're building on set to do, because we have to work around that now. And a huge thing in future too, um, like th this is what I'm most excited about. Um, and I want to see more wallets um, that support Lightning start moving towards using y or LDK. But Taproot's coming. Um, yeah, that opens the door to how Lightning is structured itself um, can be upgraded now. But look at hard-coded clients like LND, C Lightning, Eclair. Um, those dev teams are going to have to spend a fuck ton of time um, going through the client, changing things, working around a bunch of stuff that was hard coded around how Lightning works now. It's probably going to take a long time. But something like LDK, a modular library, um, you add the new functionality, um, push it, and done. And because of the modular nature of it, any application or wallet out there building on top of it, it's going to be a lot simpler for them to pull in new functionality when they want without having to wait for all of these hard coded things in a lightning node to get ripped out and reworked and everybody make sure that everything still talks to each other right and nothing broke because you forgot to change something over here. So yeah. Um, I am really psyched for this, and I think this is the first little baby step that is going to lead to um, Lightning applications getting a lot more faster paced in terms of changing, evolving, new things getting done. But Shinobi, Shinobi what about the money transmitter licenses? Yeah, Elon can go fuck himself. Like, seriously, he is a fucking greasy, scumbag, whiny little fucking piece of shit who is just butthurt that people called him out on his bullshit. So he is going around trying to fuck with people, building shit that actually helps people. He is a fucking whiny little fucking cunt. Elongated. <laughs> oh. If I saw him in person, I would fucking crack him in the face. Okay. Should All right. Remember, he's a billionaire. <laughs> I don't yeah, care. And he's working I'm for the Chinese Communist Good Party, Good luck man. suing a fucking Twitter avatar. Oh, he'll get you. No. I mean, well, this LDK kid will get the average dev to do something. That's what is going on. Forget the Elon stuff. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's not... Uh, that's not cypherpunk. It's like uh, good stuff needs to be implemented. Lightning dev kit sounds good. It sounds like uh, like you're saying more lightning apps that are getting developed. Forget Elon and all that craziness. Forgive and forget. <laughs> no. Let's move on though. Shoot all and right. forget. So, um, yeah, uh. That was a nice positive thing with Lightning. Um, but there's a lot of negative sides to Lightning. Um, you know, everybody talks about how there's no global consensus layer, so it's easier to move fast and break things. Um, that sounds nice in theory. In practice, though, um, it creates a gigantic pile of shit where you have a single thing done half a dozen different ways um, because everybody's just in their own little corner hacking away at things, trying to do stuff, not paying attention to what other people are doing, um, not communicating with other people to try and arrive at the, the optimal way of doing something. And that, that's kind of been the whole story of lightning development, um, like, you know, streaming payments, um, 
you 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 look at um, things like turbo channels, um, setting things up so that a lightning channel can be used before it's confirmed. I mean, th there are a million different things that were not properly spec'd out in a protocol sense. People just did them, pushed them out in the real world. And it's starting to get to the point that it is a giant mess of shit for people to keep track of. Uh, so Ryan Gentry um, has proposed kind of creating a uh, blip repository, um, Bitcoin Lightning Improvement Proposal, um, the same way we have BIPs, um, Bitcoin Improvement Proposals for, um, you know, the main layer of things, um, as a way to kind of keep track of all this stuff. Um, now, in terms of keeping the mess there a little cleaner, I think that's a good idea. Um, on the other hand, though, uh, I feel like doing this is going to kind of create a situation where everybody just keeps making a bigger mess because they go, oh, it's all in the same box. And it's just going to be another disincentive to actually sit down and think things through and actually spec things out as a protocol because everybody can just go, oh, no, it's in it's in the box with all the other stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not really sure kind of what to think about this idea, but I do think it's at least starting to acknowledge the fact that a lot of development in lightning is starting to become a mess. And like, if, if that's not addressed in some way, um, you know, that, that whole idea of, well, we can move fast and innovate um, is going to stop playing out that way because it's just a giant uncoordinated mess where nobody knows what's going on. Um, you know, everybody has their own different priorities. And I think that would be a very, very bad thing for Lightning because that's going to slow down progress in improving it so that it can continue being a more scalable, more useful tool to more people. So, yeah. Wow. Well, what's the remedy on this? I mean, I've seen some discussions about this where, uh, you know, there's like some push to make it more uh, cohesive in the development between like uh, Rusty Russell and, you know, um, some of the other, I mean, I've seen some, some discussions on Twitter where they're trying to make things easier and more cohesive, but that's as far as I've seen it. What else should be done here? I mean, dude, I don't know what else to say except just like call people on their bullshit. E even though that might start some drama, I like, I'm sorry. Um, lightning development is really starting to get to this point where people are looking at it like it's it's something they own and trying to control and steer things from my perspective instead of actually openly collaborating and talking with people to build a solid foundation and like that shit needs to like knock it off like you know i'm just going to be blunt like i love a lot like almost all the people at lightning labs but uh, i'm sorry guys you don't own the lightning protocol and sometimes it comes across like they think they do yeah you know i've heard that so just from other lightning developers and it would be good to see some sort of just open discussion about the development they're doing at lightning labs and just seeing some more of that in between the parties i've seen a lot of uh good discussion between lightning developers and uh you know i have high hopes but we'll see how it goes mm -hmm. all right well i guess uh take us into some different news that's out of development in the uh dev world and development in the uh legislative world and regulatory world well real quick we're skipping okay. the last lightning thing well wait i oh i missed it so, uh, Lisa from Blockstream 
has just dropped a um, draft version of a spec for liquidity ads um, in the flow of dual funding um, channels that she's done most of the work for building out in Sea Lightning. And kind of the idea here essentially is decentralized Lightning pool. Um, Lightning Labs um, service slash protocol for buying, receiving liquidity um, from different peers on the network. And like that works really quick. Um, you lock up money in a two of two multi-sig with Lightning Labs um, that has a time-locked uh, withdrawal transaction to take it back. And then they effectively make um, coin join transactions atomically where you can pay out of that account you've opened to have somebody else open a lightning channel to you um, to be able to receive money. And it's kind of like a atomic um, centralized but um, trustless uh, you know, auction space where you can buy receiving liquidity like that. Um, well, Lisa is building out um, this spec so that nodes on the network can just do this themselves without that central coordination when you try to open a channel with them um, and dual fund it. So yeah, um, this is going to be kind of interesting here. Uh, you know, there, and there, there's a lot in terms of thinking through denial of service attack vectors i could see a few being here um that might be a lot easier to abuse in a decentralized way that you really can't do with something more centralized like lightning pool um there's also kind of um you know just like the the complexity of that uh you know would that wind up potentially requiring more gossip data on the network? Um, but it's still an interesting direction to go in. And, you know, as, as awesome as I think Lightning Pool is, um, if this could be made to work without requiring a central coordinator like Lightning Labs, um, I would call that a massive fucking win for the protocol. Yeah. Right on. Considering uh, the previous story, I mean, yeah, I mean, and uh, this definitely sounds, I don't know, sounds pretty cool. Atomic coin joins. But what is up with the regulators, though? Oh, you don't even want to know. And they're coming. Big fat but, F. Yeah, the biggest F. So going into that, it looks like uh, people are currently breathing a sigh of relief in the industry when an overview of the FATF's 12-month review period dropped uh, just a little bit in uh, late June before we took our little break. So we all know that FATF is pretty damn serious when they come down to guidance. So just the push of potential guidance is something to breathe easy about, at least for now. The 12 month review is about the implementation of virtual asset service provider regulation, where they crack down on exchanges and anyone doing business in crypto. According to the FATF statement on the review, 52 of 128 reporting jurisdictions have responded to the guidance by creating rules surrounding virtual asset service providers, and six have banned them altogether. They also note there will always be jurisdictional arbitrage unless everyone implements their guidance. The FATF said, quote, these gaps in implementation also mean that we do not yet have global safeguards to prevent the misuse of VASPs for the money for money laundering or terrorist financing. Close quote. The full review was released July fifth with with uh, with potential action to mitigate these risks, but uh, I didn't see anything out of the early reporting. In the report, there will also be an emphasis on actions to help mitigate the risk of ransomware-related virtual asset use. I'm sure uh, I'm sure once we have time to plumb through that full report, we can see if there's something to report back on out of that. And all of this review aside, this is all to finalize the guidance on the travel rule, which is still in its draft form. However, its final form is coming in the next few months, and that has everyone still holding their breath. In the show notes, uh, we could see a tweet from Jake Chervinsky saying, 
Quote, some big news in global crypto policy, the FATF was expected to finalize its quite bad draft guidance on AML regulation today, but instead will delay it until October due to the volume of feedback they received. Thanks to everyone who wrote comments. This is a good start. Close quote. And I'm happy to hear that the comments left the FATF, left for the FATF has them uh, pushing back their blanket regulatory regime. I'm just uh, still worrying about what's coming. But what do y'all think about this? Is uh, you breathing relief or are you waiting, holding your breath? I don't know why, but this is all I heard in my head. But King Kai, if I let him power up all the way and then beat him, it'll demoralize him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, something I included in my June newsletter, um, and the report did get released on July 5th, and I have it linked there if anyone wants to look. Um, I plan to cover it at least in the July newsletter, um, but yeah, maybe we should cover it in the show as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. October uh, to Ian Allison, who is reporting for Coindesk on this. Um, one of the reasons why it got delayed is basically because a bunch of people complained that they were, quote, trying to catch everything in DeFi, um, and that just pissed too many people off. Like, they threw too wide a net, and it's like, that's going to affect the entire industry, fuck you. Um, and so that's probably how they got so many comments. Um, so yeah, it does not surprise me that that, um, happened. Uh, I've I don't think it was in relation to this. I think it was had. I think it had to do with something that was U.S. specific. But um, it was funny to see a uh, lawyer. Uh, I think it was Jerry Brito um, saying, "Yeah, you can basically legally uh, DDoS uh, these processes by just submitting so many comments that I mean they have to review the comments. So if you submit comments and you get others to submit comments." then they have to spend a lot of time reading and that delays whatever they're working on. So that is a way to uh, kind of push the push the ball away. Um, so I guess that's good because it gives us more time to just build everything better to the point where anything these people do is obsolete anyway. I mean, we're already at that point, but let's make it even more obsolete. There's yeah, there's too much like build back better. I'm triggered. Oh, no, not building back better. We're building now and iterating. I mean, it sounds like that's exactly what's going on. There's a lot of, uh, you know, this sort of DeFi infrastructure that's getting pushed out in different ways that seems to kind of just skirt the regulations in a way where it doesn't, it's not really, I don't know, just seeing more and more like these token infrastructures and they're getting released and in a legal way. And people have access to those. And the more that gets developed, and uh, then maybe we can just keep working as they try to regulate. Then it'll be too late because it's in most people's hands and they know how to work with it. I mean, I'm still a little worried myself just because it's the FATF and I saw how far, how hard they pushed the travel rule. And, you know, it does seem like they've got some stuff in store for that in the near future. But, I mean, hey, let's keep working right now with what we got. Also, keep in mind that the FATF is, like, not, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is. There, There is a story, um, I think it might have been the last time I covered FATF stuff, that I included some analysis by a guy from, a Dutch guy, um, like a Dutch economist, who was talking about how he could find very little documentation on what exactly the FATF is, but it's, like, not an official legislative body. They don't have any you know, they don't have any legislative power, actually. Um, so this yeah. this stuff, this guidance that they're putting out has no legislative power officially in any country. It's just that a bunch of countries just have some kind of, they have people who listen to what the FATF says, and that's it. But they don't actually have any power. And I thought, thought it was interesting that um, last month uh, when they had uh, the fourth plenary, uh, it was mentioned that there were 250 members in their global network, I guess, that kind of comes together for these meetings about um, making decisions, and that includes the IMF, the United Nations, and the World Bank. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember way back whenever we were covering the FATF's 
implementation of the travel rule at first, it was uh, it was always just I've read him as the enforcement arm of the Bank of International Settlements. And they don't really have any kind of – and I kind of just jokingly was making fun of it because it's like, yeah, you're going to try and regulate Bitcoin. That's a joke. But um, the way that they slowly but surely put a stranglehold on a lot of different countries to implement – and companies to implement the travel rule and in different ways within Bitcoin, I really started to take them more seriously where it seems like they're a uh, – yeah, you're right. It's like an unelected body. It's like it's like I don't know who they are. They're just kind of like goons. They're just like uh, you know the ones who go around and put the pressure on. They have about as much legislative power as a hall monitor. <laughs> well, it does seem like we're in different times right now. I mean, just the way that the IMF has been trying to push back on El Salvador's move has been seen as kind of, uh, well, in light of today's social justice world, seems kind of stupid. Dude, it's the name of the game. Legislated things um, are subject to due process when you just roundabout create a private entity that isn't they're not it's, it's the whole game of this the last century we're going to play the game of, of look at the government and then move it somewhere private and go but that's not the government yeah i mean it's just that's where i kind of get i'm kind of holding my breath a little bit because i mean at the same time we're looking at the bank of international settlements fully back in you know cbdc's and they're working to try and implement this surveillance state as hard as they can it's just uh at one point in time i feel like the hammer is going to drop on a lot of jurisdictions that have been working um underneath the surface in this capacity like with the fatf to try and create this global regime to clamp down on any sort of asset that they can't control eh, i mean kind of segue here a bit i'm not so sure that they're going to be able to really pull this off um quickly at all um i think it's coinbase bitgo fidelity and kraken and gemini um are actually building out and have just done the first um, test in the last couple of weeks of their protocol to comply with the travel rule. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, they're still terrified and building out the aspect of the system that would actually transfer people's personal information along with an actual transaction um, and making sure that that goes to the right place not the wrong place that that's handled correctly and their their first version of of this protocol is only supporting bitcoin and ethereum not even tokens on top of ethereum like erc20 tokens just ethereum so also like the, the only complexity using here dummy dummy pii well yeah because it's it's just testing but like the the complexity of this i think is finally starting to dawn on them and the fact that if they fuck up anything managing people's personal information in a way that sends that somewhere it's not supposed to go um potentially leaks that publicly like that can cause a gigantic shit show for them so i think the like whatever happens when the actual regulations and, and guidance are finalized um actually implementing that is going to be a glacial process and anybody who does not move at a glacial pace is probably going to fuck up um mismanage people's personal information and that'll be a really fun shit show for them to deal with in public well i hope that's the case i just like seeing companies like Kraken and Coinbase, who are working with a lot of governments, you know, working to build this protocol, just seeing that, like, uh, it kind of makes me take them more seriously. But to see that it's, you know, failing on its, you know, falling flat on its face, that's really good news. I mean, it's just like you, you, you can't rush something like that because if you fuck it up, like, you're, yeah, you're, you're in big doo doo. You're, you're legally obliged to all kinds of protections and ways you handle people's personal information when you talking finance like that's <laughs> well i hope it keeps working in the fashion where they respect people's privacy i just hope it fails 
Row, row, row the block gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. So, let's just keep moving on then. Uh, looks like another development we've been watching is the uh, Chinese mining ban and subsequent ASIC migration developments. Now Bitmain has suspended sales of their ant miner globally. Bitmain has also stated they are looking for, quote, quality power supplies overseas. And Bitmain released a statement saying, Overseas mining sites are not built overnight, and selling pressure is huge in the secondary market. And that was a quote from them, and this is all in an effort to smooth the transition of the industry, Bitmain said. It looks like the mining giant is scouting out power supplies in Belarus, Sweden, Norway, Angola, and the Congo. And just on the other day, on July 5th, Bitmain released a tweet saying, quote, Bitmain has signed purchase orders with Atlas Mining throughout 2020 and 2021. The company's the company purchases amassed a total of a total order of 67,400 units of the S19 series miners. Atlas Mining overall mining capacity will increase after the product delivery in its global mining sites. Close quote. And after doing a quick search, it looks like Atlas Mining could be uh, new facilities being set up in the Philippines. So it looks like Bitmain is trying to play their cards right to keep a certain percentage of hash power offline and before they boot back up in another country somewhere. Uh, but overall, I guess it's a, a good thing to see them moving out of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's control. Uh, but unfortunate for the Chinese people. What do you guys think of this story? I hope that Bitmain goes fucking bankrupt. It amazes me that even after the company split in half down the middle due to insane civil war shit, that they're still around. Like, just die already. <laughs> Basically what you've been saying the entire time of Black Digest's history. All right. Well, I guess, uh, you know, that is... Just uh, whatever news, let me go back to what I didn't cover in the lineup because I'm a little disorganized. So Blockstream news, Blockstream released a Bitcoin mining note on Liquid. And oh, let me pull up this tweet out from Blockstream. The Blockstream mining note has reached its first 24-hour period mining 0.02092711 BTC per BMN and exceeding it, the expected daily luck with eight blocks generated. And they give you a link to track latest mining stats from the BMN Blockstream Finance page. And it's a, uh, like I was saying, it's a note li issued on Liquid. And it says one BMN equals 2,000 terahash uh, of hash rate at a facility that Blockstream's created. and. You know that BMN that is uh, that's a position that you could hold for three years before the BTC is released, and that's all in cold storage. And this is a secure it's a security token released through the Luxembourg Secur Securitization Fund. And yeah, it's just um, you can get up to 0 0.01 BMN, and this is an investment in Blockstream's mining facilities. It's just a, a tokenized liquid asset. The Blockstream mining note, like we're saying. You know, this whole new DeFi iterate around the regulation, it looks like uh, that is going to be where people are creating their own assets. And we've been seeing this in other areas of the of the space. And now here it is in the mining industry. I mean, like we've said in the stories before, is like there's a bottleneck with mining hardware and some people want access to the mining network. Uh, and that sort of uh, financial instrument is now being delivered through Blockstream in this BMN. And it's... Uh, it is available to uh, investors, and that includes people in the States, and there's ways to get that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting seeing over time how these numbers play out because, like, honestly, when they first announced the raise, like, they got, like, almost no buyers compared to the tranche or tranches that they had available for sale. So, I mean... I, I'm kind of interested to see if that changes um, based on the miners actually up and running and being able to see the performance now. Yeah, I'd imagine we'll see some a lot more activity now that people can track it and see that it's up and moving. So, 
there is some funny things happening with a funny shit coin, Jin. What's the what's the first funny thing? Yeah, uh well we don't usually talk about meth much, but when we do, it's usually the oops I did it again type of stories. Um many of you may have heard that Ethereum is trying to go 2.0 with proof of stake soon tm lots of to be determines in there and one of the largest stake validation organizations i guess you could call it in this process uh stake hound uh, as you will see they are probably not uh the largest anymore but stake hound was supposedly using tools from two third-party service vendors fireblocks and coin cover for their uh ether private key management handling stuff and according to Calcalis Tech, um, Stakehound has uh, filed a lawsuit against Israeli company Fireblocks, claiming that it lost approximately $75 million worth of cryptocurrencies it was entrusted with. Stakehound claims that Fireblocks, a developer of secure cross-enterprise asset transfer infrastructure, was negligent, and as a result, the funds have been lost and cannot be recovered. The lawsuit was filed today at the Tel Aviv District Court by attorneys uh, so and Fireblocks has denied any wrongdoing, claiming that the keys were generated by the client and stored outside the Firebox platform, and that the customer did not sh uh, store the backup with a third-party service provider per our guidelines. Um, according to the lawsuit, um, negligence by a Fireblocks employee led to the crypto assets being lost without any backup being available. This is a human error committed by an employee of the defendants who work in an unsuitable work environment and did not protect or back up the defendant's private keys needed to open the relevant digital wallet, and for no apparent reason the keys were deleted, preventing the plaintiff's digital assets from being accessed. CoinCover, uh, the other third party, the company trusted with actually backing up the private keys, um, received the keys but could not check if they could open the digital wallet due to a confidentiality agreement. In order to recover the keys through the backup made by CoinCover, a copy of it must be kept at Fireblocks so that at the time of recovery it can be verified. According to Fireblocks CEO Michael Shalove, what actually happened was that the customer engaged in an activity called stacking, which cre creates interest. Watch out for the ambulance. Okay, anyway, um, stacking which creates interest for Ethereum coins, the customer did so in preparation for the release of Ethereum 2.0. They took crypto from people until the new coin arrived in exchange for future interest. In the framework they created, uh, there is a password the client needs as soon as the new network is established. Fireblocks does not create the password for the network because it does not yet exist. This is a technology we do not know how to support. What we did do for them through our research team was to help them develop an application they ran in order to generate a password which needed to back up and provide instructions for backing it up. They did not back up the password and did not confirm it. And Fireblocks independently published a statement on their own website uh, when this report uh, came out last month, which is also linked in the description and has many of the same comments and basically presents their side of the story. Either way, this is all um, very uh, reminiscent of other Ethereum kerfuffles in the past. Um, and yeah, things are not going well. People, people are losing money. Oh, they're going to lose a lot more. Oh, man. So, I think it was a couple months ago, um, we talked about on the show how F2 Pool, for their Ethereum mining, um, was monetizing minor extractable value. So, like TLDR, the idea that you have all these DEXs and smart contracts on chain, if a miner sees a transaction that can profitably you know, make money interacting with a DEX or something, they can just not mine that transaction and mine their own and take that same trade and pocket the profit for themselves. Um, okay, so F2 Pool um, started doing this for their miners. Um, some, some sweet, blessed soul out there decided they were going to implement a smart contract that allows users to incentivize miners to reorg the blockchain to capture minor extractable value that they missed 
because somebody already got their shit confirmed in a block. So not only prior to this were, were like were miners front running all of the DeFi and Dex shit that makes Ethereum so valuable and inevitably will just eat all of that value alive because of incentives. But it is getting to the point where that incentive is literally creating a reason to reorganize the fucking blockchain. Um, I'm sorry, Brilliant. guys. When are you finally going to admit that we were all right and this system is completely broken at the foundation? You can't fix it. Give up. <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I don't know how this stuff is still taken seriously other than if it's just some way to try and control people's money and they try to put them all on this platform however they can. But, I mean, it's total dumpster fire. I mean, once you start looking under the hood of like this, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare or shit show for all these people trying to pull off this. <laughs> it's just funny. Comedy. It's a global comedy. We're all watching it. Okay, so let's talk more about some comedy. The Bank of International Settlements, they're backing CBDCs now, so of course. So the Bank of International Settlements have recently stated they fully back development of central bank digital currencies, saying they are needed to modernize finance and ensure big tech doesn't take control of the money. Benoit Kobir of the Bank of International Settlements said that, quote, the train has left the station, referring to the move towards CBDCs. He also said, quote, it is not that we are getting carried away, we are just looking around, close quote. And this is all in an effort to save themselves, now competing with that marketplace where Mark Zuckerberg's Libra project has now evolved to be the DIM project, and others are out there like the USDC and Gemini Dollar and some of these projects are being defended against or actively used by the Bank of International Settlements to gauge its potential use to be used in their systems. Kawir said, quote, This is a place where you don't want to be, where governments don't want to be, describing it as a loss of control of sovereign money. And my guess is he doesn't understand the meaning of the word sovereign. Now, the article talks about the launch of some of these systems in multiple different countries and mentions China has a number of ongoing trials. So it looks like the Bank of International Settlements is in the testing phase for now saying authorities will have to decide whether citizens need digital IDs to use CBDCs or go down a token-based route. In the view of the Bank of International Settlements, the ID system would be better way to go because that could eliminate access to other nations' currencies. It definitely appears the Bank of International Settlements is very serious about issuing a CBDC in the near future. The, in the near future, this article mentions that this tech is just a couple of years out. And we'll follow the development and see how it goes. Pretty typical position for the Bank of International Settlements, but it's pretty unbelievable that we're at this point. But uh, what do y'all think of this? Please, bro, please don't use something like Bitcoin, bro. Okay, what do you need? What do you need? You got fast payments? We got fast payments, bro. Okay, like, please, bro, just please don't do it, bro. Please. Come on, bro. Come on, bro, please. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the marketplace, but we'll see how it goes. I'm sure that they're going to, you know, start trying to get more jurisdictions to issue some sort of digital dollar. It's like the digital yuan, something that they can control if they can. Because as it looks like, Ethereum is just going to be a bricked up piece of nonsense. Yep. Not a viable alternative. Time to build your own. All right, so... What's the drama at Casa? Uh, is it my turn now? Uh, yeah, you got the Casa story for us? Yeah, so there is a very interesting blog post from Jameson Lop at Casa last week. Uh, one of their customers had a bit of a scare, to put it mildly, in a crossover between a secure... Bitcoin key management and the horrors of modern dating and dating apps. 
And uh, they shared the details of the incident with CASA um, after they also kind of sent an emergency request to lock down their account to prevent any further attempts uh, to maybe get their Bitcoin. And uh, they did so so that uh, CASA could warn others who may fall into a similar uh, Tinder trap. Um, so basically, they were is a bachelor who, like tens of millions of others, uses dating apps to meet women. Last week, he came across the profile of a woman whose Tinder bio stated that she worked as a crypto trader. Our client found this intriguing and messaged her, since it is rare to come across someone who is interested in talking about crypto. Um, I don't know, just personally, um, I don't know. I uh, <laughs> having someone with crypto trader in their bio is not a is not a turn on. Just saying. Uh, in one of his first messages with this woman, he mentioned that he too was a crypto trader in the aims of establishing some common ground. Um, I, hope I just lost the place. Where did I go? One second. Um, yeah. After chatting online, they decided to meet up at a coffee shop. The person who showed up looked similar to the photos on the Tinder profile, but not exactly the same. He didn't think much of it because, uh, people often don't look like their profile photos. At the coffee shop, she said her parents bought her one Bitcoin for $30,000. Oh, great. Um, so basically a very, very fresh noob. Um, but otherwise, she didn't talk about crypto for the rest of their time together. Afterwards, they went for a walk and eventually settled on going to the client's residence for a drink. Oh, God. Um, they stopped to buy alcohol, but upon getting the client getting to the client's residence, he noticed she was more interested in listening to music than in drinking. After some period of time, the client went to the restroom. While he was there, we suspect the woman laced our client's drink with, uh, Shinobi, you might know what this is, scop scopolamine? Devil's breath. Do you know how to pronounce this word, this drug? Nope. I thought you were going to say Rohypno. Scopolamine scopolamine something also known as devil's breath or a ben or a benzodiazepine uh these drugs are well known see i can't pronounce them because um drugs not my area clearly um they're well known to cause loss of inhibition and memory loss his memories are fuzzy after this point but the client recalls drinking a bit more after returning from the restroom sometime later he believes the woman picked up his phone and asked him to show her how to unlock it and find his passwords he knew that something didn't seem right, but his inhibitions and safeguards had been stripped away. The last thing he remembers is kissing her. Our client woke up the next day in his bed and noticed his phone was missing. Though his wallet, along with cash, debit cards, and ID, was still there, uh, no other valuables such as his electronics and passports were stolen from the residence. In short, um, the uh, woman or someone she worked with, they suspect it was other people she worked with, uh, used his phone to gain access to his online life, including cryptocurrency exchange accounts. Uh, and in the end, he apparently lost only a little bit of Bitcoin because he was able to stop or reverse transfers after contacting those third parties. His CASA wallet was fine because the phone uh, only contained one of the five keys in the multi-sig, so that was safe. Um, and he, uh, Jameson ends the post by providing several bits of practical advice, um, which, uh, you know, given our audience uh, proclivities, as I understand them, might be useful. Always meet strangers in public places, preferably one with surveillance cameras, so that footage can be collected by law enforcement if something goes wrong. Now, I'm not sure about that bit of advice because I am not uh, pro-surveillance, but if, if you want to check yourself from crazy women who are trying to lace your drink, maybe that will help you. Um, compare the person's profile photo when you meet them in real life. It, if, it, if it is questionable that the photos are actually of themselves, that is a red flag. Never leave food or drinks unattended. Uh, never accept food or beverages offered by strangers or new acquaintances. Limit consumption of intoxicants to a stranger in a private setting. Always have a friend who will check in if they have not heard from you after a predetermined time. This friend should know as much as possible about your location, plans, and the person you are meeting. Never publicize or discuss your crypto holdings or interests with strangers. If a stranger mentions being into crypto but then does not actually seem to know much about it, consider that they may simply be fishing for a specific type of victim. So the uh, the advice here is to basically only date known Bitcoiners. Um, sorry, uh, a lot of us are taken already. Um, if a stranger, uh, oh wait, consider activating a remote wipe feature on your phone. This should not be relied upon as protection. However, as a remote wipe feature cannot be used if you are unconscious, obviously. Protect your holdings with multi-sig and keep your keys at different locations. Even if you are totally compromised, it will be impossible for the attacker to move funds without moving to multiple locations, which is not practical. 
Um, I have a feeling that many uh, of those in our audience who are male may be a bit dismissive of the idea that you should take this much caution uh, or skepticism when approaching women you are meeting in a dating context. In fact, I would argue you should actually take it more seriously because despite there being a physical power dynamic difference usually between uh, men and uh, women, um, there is this assumption that they can never have the upper hand. And uh, yes, clearly that is a bad assumption uh, and you should actually follow this advice. Sorry if it ruins your dating life, but to be honest, you are probably better off keeping away from anyone who wouldn't want to interact with you unless you were drinking heavily or getting drugged. Just, just, just a thought. Okay, now that the woman is done talking, <clears throat> men, as long as you aren't a <laughs> lightweight pussy who can't handle their drugs, you, you're fine. You got nothing to worry about. Oh my god, Shinobi, you're terrible. <laughs> Yeah, come on. This is where Bitcoin incentivizes marriage and long-term relationships with uh, responsible goals. Because you know you are responsible for your private keys, and you don't want to be, uh, you know, yeah, just getting a little too lackadaisy around those that you shouldn't. Your your private keys and your private keys. Exactly. Go find floozies in the real world. Like it's not that hard. This yeah. is basically like Shinobi. Shinobi is the devil monkey jumping up and down on one shoulder, and Rick and I are on the other shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I, I have nothing against like long-term relationships. Absolutely for it. I'm just saying, if you are out to try and find a floozy, maybe don't do it on the internet. Maybe, maybe especially don't tell them you have Bitcoin. Like, you know. Yeah, definitely don't put crypto trader in your bio. That sounds only, stupid. Only consider it if they put toxic maximalist. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Well, I've got the most toxic maximalist story next. It looks like a new player has entered the octagon. Michael Saylor's speculative attacks are about to be dwarfed by the incoming lot of players. George Soros just recently gave the okay for his multi-billion dollar hedge fund to start playing in the Bitcoin pools. The Soros fund management is said to be around $27 billion, and they don't play around. This report comes to us from Bitcoin Magazine Deep Dive Newsletter. Now, the long and short for a speculative attack is that you borrow cheap currency to purchase strong currency. However, with big players like Soros, there's all sorts of room to make things go in his favor. He can play the long game and have certain time terms for loans on the currency. He's used his weight in the past to destroy the Bank of England's position with the British pound back in 1992. And now he's entering the Bitcoin arena. This uh, Things are about to get even more interesting. I don't even know which uh, direction to speculate. How about you guys? I'm pretty sure Soros will be bad for Bitcoin, but I don't know. Maybe he'll get wrecked. What do you guys think? Um, well, he loves to try and break things like the Bank of England, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I will say though, if Bitcoin broke Soros, that would be fucking hysterical. Like, it's yeah, a true popcorn moment if that were to happen. Well, we'll see how it goes because he's about to start trading Bitcoin with the 27 billion, and uh, I imagine. We're going to see something happen to his position. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Are we ready for an autism? Oh, one of those RBF moments. Take us on to it. So, the idea has been floated by Antoine Riard um, of making RBF just default um, by... Bitcoin Core version 0.24.0. Um, so right now, in order to use replace by fee, um, you have to opt into it. You actually have to set a flag on your transaction um, that says you want this to be replaceable with a higher fee. Otherwise, 
nobody's mempool will actually allow a replacing transaction in while the original is still there. Um, this was originally done because of irrational shrieking about that screwing up um, merchants who accept zero comp transactions um, and making it easier to rip them off. Um, now, given that that is pretty much a, a non-existent thing, or if it is anywhere, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, you know, we should just acknowledge that in practice, you can replace something in a mempool no matter what, whether it's flagged or not. And this requiring the flag is just a way to leave room for people to screw themselves. Um, so the idea is, you know, in the next couple releases, um, shift things around so that any transaction period um, in the mempool will be replaceable by something with a higher fee. Um, yeah, and honestly, I, I don't really see any rational argument against this at this point. Um, yeah. RBF by default. Yep. So I guess last thing for me. Um, ah, man. So Jack Dorsey a while back tweeted out a long thread on key management, um, specifically talking about places like El Salvador and the cost of hardware wallets. Um, specifically, uh, the thing I took you know, issue with was him saying that the idea of having a screen to verify what you are signing isn't really useful because it makes the hardware more expensive and people don't do that anyway. Well, apparently, um, Square actually is going to make a hardware wallet, um, specifically designed for low-income shit. Um, and my response is, not yay. Um, my response is, holy <laughs> shit, um, with statements like that coming out of Jack's mouth, you're a fucking idiot. Um, no. No. Depending, now I, I'm going to wait and see the actual design details as those get spec'd out and built. But if this is going to go in the direction of just as cheap as possible, because um, just make it cheap, um, then fuck no. Um, that is an absolutely idiotic idea. Um, trading off security for um, cost being lower? No. Um, show people how to use a multi-sig wallet um because just like just trying to hit a price point so that so-called poor people can afford a hardware wallet for extra security what good does that do if you boil away all of the security to get to that low fucking cost point multi-sig exists use that but the the notion of just make a hardware wallet cheaper because poor people exist, that is absolutely asinine and idiotic design goals for something that is supposed to provide security for something you custody yourself. Like, that's completely fucking moronic. Well, yay for the morons that are going to secure theirs with Square's hardware wallet. Yeah, so I really hope I'm wrong, but if that is the whole direction that this project goes in, then fuck that. Um, no. Well, the whole hardware wallet scene is definitely competitive. And, I mean, Square's a big company. So, I mean, I don't know what to think other than, you know, there's another hardware wallet coming into the space that I guess is going to be developed in some sort of open source fashion. Like, I was reading about it. It's like some sort of open source development. And we'll see how it goes. But, uh,. Like you're saying, I mean, like, you know, price point shouldn't be the main focus when you're talking security. I mean, there needs to be there needs to be strong hardware available for these hardware wallets. But we'll see. All right. That is you up for the last one, Jenny. Yeah, so uh, we're short on time today, but I just wanted to provide another Assange 
case update. Um, first of all, on July 3rd, he turned 50 years old. That means he spent the last decade, a fifth of his life, either under house arrest or police coerced asylum or jail or prison in the UK. Not a great uh, time. Interestingly, one of the key witnesses, known commonly as Ziggy, uh, for the superseding indictment by the U.S. government, has admitted to fabricating key accusations in the indictment against the WikiLeaks founder, the witness who has a documented history with sociopathy and convictions for sexual abuse of minors and wide-ranging financial fraud, has made the admission in a newly published interview in Stunden, where he also confessed to having continued his crime spree whilst working with the Department of Justice a promise of immunity from prosecution end quote uh it is a fascinating article uh, a little bit long and i will just read the end of it because it is truly special quote it is as if the offer of immunity later secured and sealed in a meeting in dc had encouraged ziggy to take bolder steps in crime he started to fleece individuals and companies on a grander scale than ever usually by either acquiring or forming legal entities he then used to borrow merchandise rent luxury cars even order large quantities of goods from wholesalers without any intention to pay for these goods and services ziggy also forged the name of his own lawyer on notices registry falsely claiming to have raised the equity of two companies to over 800,000 US dollars. The aim was to use these entities with solid financial positions on paper in a real estate venture. The lawyer has reported the forgery to the police where other similar uh, where other similar cases along with multiple other reports of theft and trickery are now piling up. When confronted with evidence of all these crimes by a stranded journalist, he simply admitted to everything and explained it away as normal business practice. He has not yet been charged and is still practicing this, quote, business. TV reported last week that Ziggy has attempted to order merchandise on credit using a new company name, Icelandic Vermin Control. Despite using a fake name and a COVID face mask, he was identified and the transaction was stopped. He was last seen speeding away in a white Tesla, according to DV. End quote. Um, despite this amazing disclosure, uh, the UK High Court has decided to allow the US government um, a limited appeal to the decision to deny extradition in January this year, and the U.S. government is now claiming that it will make assurances that uh, uh, basically uh, say they will allow Assange to serve out any sentence given uh, in his home country of Australia and that they will not subject him to SAMs or um, special administrative measures, um, basically... Uh, <laughs> isolation and uh, solitary confinement uh, and a bunch of other things that are not considered humane in actual uh, humane democratic countries unless he passes the test to qualify for SAMs, which is um, not exactly a reassuring promise to make, basically saying, yeah, we won't put him in SAMs unless he fits the criteria for being put in SAMs. Um, yeah, don't trust. Don't trust these people, period. Yep. All right. Uh, so, final thoughts time. Um, final thought. Um, just go out there and enjoy life if you can. Find something fun to do and have fun. Jenny. Fud. Uh, yeah. Have fun. Uh, dance like no one's watching or something like that. Definitely encrypt like no one's watching. I think y'all should just have fun Finance, staying poor. like no one's watching. I like that. Have fun staying poor, and then just have fun. All right. Finance, like nobody's watching. I'm into it. <laughs> With luck, we will be back before another three weeks. Right. All right. And we may note, just have too much fun. Catch you later, punks. Later, everyone. Our feeders in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>